Our next guest has spent decades reporting from China, from the death of longtime Chinese leader Mao Zedong in 1976 to the massacre in Tiananmen Square following massive protests in 1989, to the United Kingdom's handover of Hong Kong to the PRC in 1997. Joining us now, longtime foreign correspondent Mike Chinoy. He's now a non-resident senior fellow at the U.S.-China Institute at the University of Southern California and author of the new book, Assignment China, an oral history of American journalists in the People's Republic. Thanks so, for being on this morning. So great to have you with us, Mike. Uh, my God, uh, what you've seen through the years. Uh, why don't you tell us what we're going to see in the book? The book is based on over 100 interviews I did during the past 15 years with people who've covered China for the U.S. media from 1945 and the start of the Chinese Civil War right through the COVID pandemic up to the present day. The idea is that most folks... Uh, who watch the news or read the news don't have any idea how that news got there. But as anyone who's in the news business knows, the process by which people report and write and transmit the news is central to what folks uh, see. So I thought it would be interesting to get people who have been on the front lines, the, the people who've told the China story, to tell their own story. What was it like to be in Shanghai when the Communist Army rolled in in 1949? What was it like to go on the press plane to China with Richard Nixon or to be in Tiananmen Square, as I was in 1989, or to try to cover China under the very, very tight repression and restrictions that exist today? So that's the premise of the book. And there are many, many household names that people will have read or watched telling kind of behind-the-scenes stories of how they did what they did. I mean, I, you know, it, it's been such a remarkable, such a tumultuous history, uh, a violent history under Mao, but even uh, as, as they move beyond Mao. Uh, you talked about Tiananmen Square, uh, we, uh, the handover uh, of, of Hong Kong. Of course, the last couple of years, the crackdown in Hong Kong, COVID. Uh, what, what did they tell you? What did you learn about how difficult it was uh, to, I mean, we look at Janice Mackey Freyer when she, she reports out of Beijing, a totalitarian uh, 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 government. Uh, it, it seems at times you have to measure your words, but it takes a certain type of reporter to, to, to cover the news there. Well, the central theme in Assignment China has been this endless struggle that American and other foreign journalists have had to go through to sort of penetrate the secrecy in, uh, that the Chinese Communist Party has imposed. Uh, the party, the Communist Party, wants to impose its own narrative on both the foreign press and the Chinese people, and now increasingly with China's global clout on the rest of the world. So it's been an endless battle to try and penetrate that. It's ebbed and flowed depending on internal conditions in China, which have gone from extreme repression to relative relaxation, and then back to now to the very, very tight controls that uh, Chinese leader Xi Jinping has imposed. So I think today, conditions for uh, the American and foreign press uh, uh, in the People's Republic are more difficult than perhaps at any time since China began its so-called reform and open-door policy of market-oriented changes in the late 70s, which right. went along with opening diplomatic relations with the U.S. It's a very, very tough beat, but it's crucially important, given especially the deterioration in relations between China and the U.S., so, Mike, I look at China through a lens of a personal experience, I think, over 40 years ago, was it? Mm, yeah. <laughs> Dating myself, but uh, when my father had Deng Xiaoping to our home in McLean, Virginia, for a, an estate, a state dinner that happened in our private home, um, working on normalization of relations with China, can you talk about how things have changed, even digressed since that important moment? Well, Deng Xiaoping uh, was, uh, the, on the Chinese side, the architect of the establishment of diplomatic relations uh, with the U.S. And I think to many Americans, he was kind of the cuddly communist. He came here, he wore a cowboy hat at a rodeo in Texas. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the sense in the United States was that China was a potentially valuable uh, strategic partner in the Cold War against the Soviet Union and a potentially important economic partner. Uh, and one of the things that I think is really uh, complicated in the tensions that have developed between the U.S. and China today um, is that unlike the Cold War, there's this extraordinary 
uh, interconnectedness between the United States and China now. Uh, there's mi millions, billions of dollars of American investment in China. There are thousands of Americans living there. There are thousands of Chinese uh, living here. There are all kinds of connections linking the two societies, even as the governments are increasingly at loggerheads. And that makes the notion of a conflict much more troublesome, uh, both in terms of its impact on the people involved and, and in terms of managing it as a, from a policy point of view. Mike, as you've been talking, we're showing pictures of President Xi standing in solidarity with President Putin. Their extended visit in Moscow continues today. What should an American audience make of these images of the Chinese president rushing to Moscow to be seen with President Putin at this time, a year in now to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, where the West, of course, is on the side of Ukraine and funding and backing President Zelensky while Russia is attacking civilians, Russia is attacking infrastructure. What does this mean for our relationship with China? It's uh, Xi Jinping's embrace of Vladimir Putin is not going to help his China's relationship with the United States. The Chinese and the Russians, I think, see themselves as allies in trying to, uh, to counter and push back against what they see as the U.S.-led uh, world order. And while we don't know a lot of details about the sea visit, I think it's fair to say that certainly on the economic front, there'll be expanded cooperation on the sort of strategic front. How far it will go militarily, uh, we don't know. But it's complicated because China is very economically dependent on its trade with the West, on its trade with the United States. So on the one hand, uh, Xi and Putin want to stand up against Washington. On the other hand, Xi needs to have uh, functioning trade ties with Europe and, and with the U.S., especially because the Chinese economy is in trouble now. So it's not quite as simple a calculation as it looks. Do you think, Mike, that China and the President Xi has the juice um, to influence Vladimir Putin in, as far as the war in Ukraine goes? Can he, he says he's brought a peace proposal with him. Whatever that means, Putin says he's reviewed it with great consideration. Does President Xi have the influence over Vladimir Putin to bring this war in some way to an end? I don't know that he does, and I don't know that he wants to, because I think there are some benefits to China of the war continuing. It's distracting for the United States. The U.S. is pumping military hardware uh, into Ukraine, which it might otherwise be using to beef up Americans' position in the Pacific, uh, giving concerns about the possible conflict with China over Taiwan. Uh, the peace plan, I think, is, is widely seen as a non-starter. She hasn't spoken with the Ukrainian leader Zelensky yet in all of the months uh, that they, they've, they've been, uh, the conflict has been going on. Um, so I think that's really kind of posturing that, that a lot of people will, will see through. The book is Assignment China, an oral history of American journalists in the People's Republic. Mike Chinoy, thank you very much. Congratulations on the book and thanks for being on this morning. Thanks for having and me.